could have done a podcast of what we were talking about just before the show. Yeah, every, every conversation we have is fodder for a show. <laughs> it, it is. It seems like. Yeah. yeah. Interesting stuff. And uh, one more week to go before the Oscars. Uh, still feels like there's not as much heat about the Oscars this year as in previous years. Yeah, and, and it's it's an odd thing because I thought maybe the Me Too movement would, yeah. in fact, work the opposite way around. You know, generate Make people a pay, lot it, pay more attention. Pay more attention, but it yeah. seems to me that it's been going on for so long uh, that that sort of energy has has sort of uh, you know slipped away. Yeah, and then you have the movies themselves. You have some good movies here. I, well, it, I still honestly, I every day I bounce back and forth. I, I I'm thinking, okay, it feels like Lady Bird and Get Out have maybe bumped up a little bit, and Shape of Water has nudged back, and Three Billboards has lost some ground. But honestly, I could see any of those. And even Dunkirk winning. The yeah. one I don't see winning, obviously, is Darkest Hour. Uh, that I don't, I don't, I don't think has a shot. Um, that'll get Best Actor. But uh, yeah, the, the, all those one. others, I think, I, I just, you know, Call Me by Your Name. I don't think it has a shot. No, I don't think it'll... it will. You know, it, 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 it is a strange thing because these, it, it really has. You know, they talk about the horse race. You yeah, know, back and forth and back. Jordan Peele was running, winning a whole bunch of awards there, uh, mostly for screenplay. Uh, yeah. Uh, over the course of the uh, award season, that's what we gave him. I was able to present him with that award way back at the yep. Los Angeles Film Critics Award. Um, and then, uh, and I was a little worried for Lady Bird, but lately, Lady Lady Bird has been, you know, uh, getting a lot of. Plus, you know, the 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 press still leans toward that sort of female generated. Yeah. Uh, um, Laurie Metcalf did well. At a, couple of awards ceremonies. Yeah. So you're right. Yeah, there it is. You know, back and forth, up and down. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just look at these, and, you know, The Post doesn't have a chance. Call Me By Your Name, I don't think is a shot. Phantom Thread has no shot. No. So those those three are not in the running, but between Three Billboards, Get Out, Lady Bird, Dunkirk, Shape of Water, I think any of those uh, are in the running. Darkest Hour, not really. So I mean, there are five. There are five films that could be that could that could win. And, and, and for a moment there, each one of those five has had a moment where it yeah. looked like that would be the one. Three Billboards had a moment. Yeah. Uh, but now uh, you know I can see I can see you know three maybe Sam, uh, uh, yeah. maybe maybe Francis. But it's probably not the movie. It, the, what seems to be the case in in recent years is that ever since they went to the ranking thing, once you have ten or you know nine, ten nominees, and you're not just saying I want this one, mm. and we count the number of you know votes for the one that gets the most. When they go to that that kind of algorithmic stuff where you rank at one, two, three, four, and each one is weighted a certain degree, mm. um, it that seems to favor movies. Not necessarily that have the strongest positives, but the ones that have the lowest negatives. Mm. Where it may not be everybody's favorite movie, but it's somewhere in the mix for just about everybody. So it's got a lot of twos and a lot of threes and a lot of fours. And um, that may that may wind up favoring the only two films here that, that have that high a level of general acceptance and no negatives. Lady Bird and Get Out. Mm. Those are the only two. Yeah, it, it, the, the question will be, well, the Academy will have seen yeah. those movies. Will, 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 will enough folks have seen those movies? You know, one of the things that sort of wiped out the energy a little bit hmm. for the Academy Awards has been the success of that movie Black Panther. Yeah, that's true. Since its opening day, yeah. which has just been phenomenal. And the Olympics. Uh, and the Olympics. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah you're, uh, at, at which we've, well, you know, what the ladies hockey team. And the regular news cycle, <laughs> yeah. which is much more dramatic than anything in any of these movies. Uh, oh, man, oh, man. So, you know, all of these things are sort of going yeah. on. They're all sort of big events. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and they're sort of mattering. I was, you know, I was round about talking about Black Panther for the last couple of days. And, and the Oscars, which is, like you said, still, a, 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 you know, a week away. Um, you know, yeah. it's it's not the standalone thing anymore. That's all no. I'm saying. Uh, there was a time when the Academy Awards was a standalone thing, and uh, pretty much everybody in the world was looking at it because there wasn't anything else to look at. It. Yep. Yeah. All right. Man. Well, it's uh, crazy. It's just crazy. I I you know I've been trying to look at the read the Guild Awards and you know uh, figure out what's gonna what's gonna what. I mean, I it. it it seems to me a fairly easy call that Del Toro will win Best Director. He won mm -hmm. the DGA Award. But, you know, the winner of the DGA Award and the winner of Best Director hasn't been the director of the Best Picture 
in like three or four out of the last five years. Yeah. So that would tend to say Shape of Water will be the film that wins the most awards and wins Best Director, but something else will get Best Picture. Mm. And I guess right now, if I had to, to, to roll the dice on it, I'd say Lady Bird feels like this year's Annie Hall. Mm. Yes. Yeah, oddly, for me, I think something about that old Academy may come roaring back. Possibly. Yeah. The post, no. You know what? You know what else? What, I, what else? Kirk? Maybe. You know what else? I think will will favor Lady Bird, um, but I'm by no means saying that it's a, it's a sure thing. I think I still think any of those others could come through. But what what really uh, I think plays well for Lady Bird is the fact that Greta Gerwig is so girlish yeah. and unassuming about yeah. this. She's not. She's not Catherine Bigelow, right? Yeah, yeah. Catherine Bigelow is a director. Yeah. Like when you look at her, she's tall. She's commanding. She's intense. And, you know, you, you look at her and you're like, okay, that's a director. Greta Gerwig is out there just giggling and smiling and giving these interviews. And she's so unassuming and self-deprecating. And I'm, I can't believe this is happening to me. Um, you know, there's a homecoming queen quality that is yeah. so endearing. Just an insane sort of likability. Insane likability. And that'll, you know, she's done enough interviews. Yeah. She was on Ellen just yeah. being, I mean, that that seeps into the consciousness. So it's feeling on, like. On, on the other hand, what, you know, where's, when's the last time you saw Chris Nolan? Yeah, you know, exactly. Maybe at some cinematography. You know, but it's not yeah. on Ellen. That's yeah. for damn sure. Well, uh, sort of, you know, and and all with you know all due respect to Woody, uh, what really really won it for Annie Hall was Diane Keaton. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Diane Keaton was the Greta Gerwig of that era. Yeah, yeah. You know, the clothes and, and everything, that outfit, and and I just I I think that you know you ju- it's just disarming. Yeah. So you know that's the, and today- we're in a mood. We have a mood. We're in a national mood. Uh, yeah. Where you know what? Yeah, we we we've, we've been treating the ladies badly, and yeah. Although I don't want to diminish. The film, it's a wonderful film. It's in my top ten. An excellent, excellent film. You know, I, I, I Tanya, uh, and also an excellent, excellent film with a, 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 a central. But an film. angrier, but meaner a, yeah, movie. a little pokier yeah. sort of movie. Um, uh, so you know, I don't want to diminish it in that way. It's a film perfectly worthy. Yeah. Uh, in, in every, but a, a likability factor don't hurt you when it comes to these. No, films. it sure people doesn't. People have to vote, man. You know, and yep. Uh, who I'm going to vote for? I'm going to vote for the yep. for the for the nice lady who made the movie. That's really cute. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I mean, you know, it, and and here's the thing too. Just I mean, looking at the the people who are nominated, you know, it really is there's there's a there's an international flavor now to the uh, the Academy membership, and uh, that seems to have that seems to have really had an impact. So uh, we'll see. Anyway. Well, let's get down to uh, some DVDs what and Blu-rays. Got, yeah, what are you going to start? I got some, got some indie stuff. With the indies. Some cool little indie stuff that I want to call everybody's attention to. Uh, indie Picks uh, has released the third volume of their festival favorites, a uh, little box set that, of things that they throw out there. And um, they, they pulled out uh, their three uh, in this latest set, and two of them they sent us. Uh, both of these are docs that have been out before. Uh, the Nine Lives of Marion Barry is quite good, and uh, Marion Barry is such a such a fascinating American figure. You know, oh where man, he, yeah. It just the ups and downs of, of that career. It, there's just nothing like it. Um, really, a, a, a political figure who should have committed suicide half a dozen times. You know, the cocaine and everything else, and somehow just kept finding a way to to come on back. Anyway, uh, the Nine Lives of Marion Barry is not just about him and his career, but it's really about American politics in many respects and uh, and what it takes to navigate it and what it takes to to maintain. And it's very, very timely. Um, this was a closing night film at Silver Docks in 2010, and it is highly recommended. Really and, good movie. Uh, Tim, did you ever see this? This was this is this has uh, been out before on DVD. The Vanishing Black Male. I don't think I know that film. This is uh, it, quite a controversial film written and directed by Hassani Dubose. And um, it is, it's a really interesting, I don't know that I necessarily agree with the premise, but I'm not really qualified to disagree with the premise. Um, it is, um, it's, it's basically about the, 
the crisis of black manhood yeah. in America. Well, yeah, the, 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 in, a, in a bunch of different contexts, uh, imprisonment, uh, 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 Fa- absentee fathers, yeah. and the source of that, and uh, basically how you know a substantial number of black women feel like they cannot find. Uh, satisfactory husbands, yeah, and yeah. for whatever reasons, the incarceration rate, and all, all kinds of other things. The sort um, of a, the, a real weird sort of socioeconomic divide yeah. that runs through the black community, where you have all these black women who are getting higher educations and degrees, and 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 and, and the equivalent yeah. in black men are not keeping up, at least not in the same numbers. I, I saw this. I, I want to say about ten years ago, and uh, it was released on DVD by a different company, and it's now with Indie Picks. And um, it is, uh, I, I, it gets, it feels a little bit conspiratorial at a certain point. I mean, he interviews a lot of people, and there are a lot of ideas bouncing around, uh, and a lot of them just don't make sense at all. But the premise is is disturbing and compelling, mm. and it's it's worth checking out. So uh, those are those two are part of the third volume of the Indie Picks Fe- Festival favorites. Mm. And the uh, the film that they did not send us of that is in his own home. So uh, if you are familiar with any of these, you you might want to pick that up. We also have a whole ton of stuff from Wild Eye Releasing, and these are all just straight up, kind of straight to DVD genre indies. Most of them horror. Um, you know, not bad. I mean, these things are made for about a buck and a quarter, and uh, you can see some talent in the people that wrote and directed them, that they're working with very little money and very low, very few resources, but they're making the best they can. And uh, there are a few interesting ideas here. So uh, I'll go through these really quickly. Uh, this is all from Wild Eye Releasing, and if you, if you want to watch, you know, cool little low-budget uh, straight-to-DVD stuff that, uh, that, you know, has a certain... Has a certain cool like Blumhouse quality to yeah. it, but better than Blumhouse. I don't really like the stuff Blumhouse does. Uh, let's start with Antihuman. Get out, notwithstanding. Yeah. So this is Antihuman, which is uh, a little bit like uh, Carrie. Borrows a lot from Carrie, but uh, you know, ca- like Carrie meets The Exorcist and uh, a few other things uh, tied in here. Some interesting performances here. Anya Corzin, who stars, is very very good. And then we have the Blessed Ones. Here's the, the death is only the beginning. Uh, the, always great. Patrick O'Bell, who wrote and directed this, uh, should do some more stuff. There's a, this is, is you know this is a, one of those cult movies, uh, and I don't mean the movie is a cult movie. I mean it's about a cult uh, somewhere in the in the desert, and it feels very kind of um, apocalyptically, uh, you know, uh, David Koresh and, uh. Uh, meets Charles Manson, and you know, or, or, or King Doe. Kind of all of those. Remember the the comet oh, people, yeah. Kingdom, oh, yeah, and yeah, 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 uh, the, yeah the, Heaven's the, Gate, the Heaven's yeah, Gate with, cult, with the Martin with the wide eyes. Yeah, and, yeah. so oh, it, it un- unfortunate it, that situation. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's got a it's got a little bit of all of that in it. But uh, Patrick O'Bell, very talented director. It's uh, it's got uh, it's got a little bit of style. Dead story. The pictures are great too. I I wish you look. Th- oh, that's yeah. still. Oh yeah, that's got no, that's not from the movie. Uh, it, it I think it actually is a still from the movie, but it's a great one to uh, to put. You know, very, like a very, like a, very z- Tobe Hooper. Yeah, it's very it's a it's kind of a zombie woman crawling, climbing. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, this is a haunted house movie. Couple moves into a house and uh, really shouldn't because there are all kinds of you know things about the house. Amityville Horror is the model here, uh, directed by Sunil. Tripuranini. That name, I'm, I may need mm. to learn how to pronounce it. Mm. Quite well done. Uh, four more. The Devil's Well. Uh, this clearly, this is this this clearly, clearly borrows a whole lot from the ring, uh, along with you know uh, various other witchcraft, uh, culty things. Um, anyway, the uh, the idea here is that there's a uh, a gateway to hell in this well. Um, and every time I look at it, all I can think of is uh, what's her name, the the girl from the ring, just crawling out of that. Oh thing. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, just, that's creepy. Oh, it's so creepy. Oh, I love the ring movies, the Japanese and the the American versions. I love them all. They're great. Anyway, uh, the the disappearing woman here is uh, is Carla. So it is. It again borrows a, a great deal from the ring movies. Um, my little sister. One wrong turn and the terror begins. The taglines are always so great. So great. Uh, this is uh, this is the uh, basically trafficking in the Friday the Thirteenth uh, realm a little bit. Uh, don't go. Don't go to the. Don't camp in the woods. 
There's a monster out there. The great thing here is the monster's name is Little Sister, which I think is hysterical. Uh, so, yeah, Little Sister's out there in the woods. Don't go. You think they go? Oh, um, they, um, they almost certainly You know what? Go. It's, isn't that interesting? They don't. <laughs> they just they, they go to Palm Beach instead, and there's no conflict in the movie at all. It's 90 minutes of enjoying Palm Beach and thinking, boy, we would have gotten killed if we'd have gone into the woods where Little Sister lives. Uh, ghost Witch. Tortured souls never leave. Um, this is this is one that claims to be based on an actual story. I'd like, it, which probably means that that there were some people uh, once somewhere, who, and yeah. this is about people who are somewhere. And therefore, therefore, this is a this is based on a, on a real story, loosely based on a real story that somebody told somebody else. <laughs> so ridiculous. Um, anyway, this is very Blumhousey. Very uh, what are the what are the paranormal activities kind of yeah. movies? Yeah, this is this is kind of. Uh, this is, you know, a ghost of a of a dead girl and, and, you know, whatever. That one's kind of the lesser one of the bunch. And then um, we go a little sci-fi here, a little uh, cyberpunk with a 2047 virtual revolution. Uh, if this takes two, it takes place two years before the uh, the new Blade Runner film, then the new Blade Runner <laughs> film is way, way out of date. Uh, this is uh, produced, written, and directed by a guy named Guy Roger Duvert. This is a French production, a French genre production from uh, 2016 that has not been released yet. Now, the thing about French genre movies is that they are all kind of the ungodly bastard spawn of Luc Besson. Luc Besson. I, yeah. I guarantee you that, that guy was like a second, third oh, yeah. assistant grip. For sure. Something for Luc Besson for at sure. some point. So the uh, the uh, as these things always do to minimize the cost, they all go uh, in for kind of a dystopian uh, scenario scenario where you don't have to go outside or you don't have to use a lot of sets and yeah. use a lot. So okay, so the we now all live inside virtual worlds. Yeah. And everything is corporate controlled. So there we've created a dystopian environment that saves us money. <laughs> Good job. Uh, so anyway, it's... Uh, and you can do it in After Effects. Yeah, for sure. So uh, you basically, this is basically about a King, Dr- uh, a King a Judge Dredd type uh, mercenary who's, uh, who's got to track down a bunch of hackers who are, you know, um, screwing with the Matrix basically. So it's a little bit of Matrix, it's a little bit of uh, Judge Dredd, a little bit of RoboCop, and, and you know, all that kind of stuff thrown in. 2047, Virtual Revolution. So uh, these are all from Wild Eye Releasing, and, uh, you know, there's some, there's some stuff that's worth checking out in these things. Uh, I wouldn't say they're great to buy, but as a rental, uh, as a red box or whatever it might be, yeah, give it a look. It's good stuff. Wild Eye Releasing, 2047, Ghost Witch, My Little Sister, Don't Go in the Woods, <laughs> The Devil's Well, Anti-Human, The Blessed Ones, and Dead Story, Never Live to Tell. <laughs> oh my goodness, my goodness. Taglines are awesome. You know, it's really funny because I would have thought that, I don't know, those genres, that genre of film, you know, which go back forever, yeah, would have just drifted away. You yeah, know, over the course of the years. No, but they, not but really. They, but they really they just never go away. No. Uh, and like you said, a buck, a buck fifty to make, and you know, you get, you get, uh, you get uh, Adam Fangoria You can make you movies make. more inexpensively today than ever before. So uh, we're gonna, we're gonna have these, we're gonna be living with these movies for a long time. More inexpensively, but not necessarily better. One of the guys who did prove that you could make movies very, very inexpensively is Sean Baker. That's there we go. There's our transition. To that lovely yeah. little thing. <laughs> made, that, made that lovely movie, uh, Tangerines, with its iPhone and a bunch of whatever little equipment he did. Yeah. This year, The Florida Project, not as much lo- love as I would have thought vis-a-vis the Academy Awards, yeah. particularly that one empty slot there. Um, you know, for the ten, yeah, you know, nine or nine, yeah, that, that empty slot there. This could be in that empty slot. I, I will admit, even though I do not like the film... I understand why everybody does. Willem got nominated, of course. Willem got nominated, and uh, uh, yeah, I am a little bit surprised. I mean, it was it was in the mix for us in the LA Film Critic voting, uh, but it didn't. It it kind of flame. I, I I thought this would really be a front runner in a lot of ways, just given all the love for it. But uh, it is it is it is it's gritty and raw, and it's a little bit um, anti narrative. Mm, yeah. And uh, it's the thing that Sean does, you know, it's it's what he does. I mean, it's, uh, you know, for those who don't know, the Florida Project takes place in a uh, uh, in a uh, basically a motel where the the these kind of lower echelon people live. 
and right outside Disney World. Right outside Disney World, and that's the that's the conceit of the film, which is that right there in Disney World, you know, this be- the, the, this place that represents all of these dreams is this ramshackle motel that people just drive by, where people are literally just clinging on to life. Yeah, yeah. And it mostly centers around that uh, that little girl and her mom, Brooklyn Prince, who I thought might have gotten a little nomination herself, not unlike a little girl from Beasts of the Southern Wild. Yeah, two or three or four, or five. Or six. See yeah. now, Beast, it, 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 that's a good comparison between the two. I yeah. mean, this sort of was the Beast of the Southern Wild of this of year. This, of, of, of this year. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, people liked it. Uh, but there, and, and it's not like it didn't do it didn't do well. It did fine. It did fine. Yeah. Uh, uh, given given what it is. In any case, here it is. Uh, special features include Under the Rainbow, the making of the Florida projects, bloopers and outtakes, uh, cast and crew interviews, and a few things like that. Men from Earth, Holocene, did not make it into theaters, but uh, it's uh, it, it, it it's worth checking out. I'd I'd say again as a, a kind of a rental, uh, directed by Richard Shankman. This is a cool little uh, genre film about a professor who um, is he's he's like the oldest man in the world. He's he's like an immortal, right? I yeah. mean, he's he's been around for fourteen thousand years. And um, he's he's trying to sort of maintain you know his his secret and carry on as nor- as much of a normal life as he possibly can, and um, it, it, when the secret is divulged to certain people, anyway, it, it creates problems. In any case, uh, this is a uh, this is a sequel to Jerome Bixby's The Man from Earth, um, which is stretching it a little bit. Uh, I'm not sure that that movie necessarily needed a sequel, and uh, certainly not at this point in time. But, I've, you know, it's interesting that that's sort of the, the impetus here. Um, lots of extras on here, which are in many respects even better than the movie. But, uh, you, you know, Shankman does a, uh, an audio commentary along with his producer. There's tons of behind-the-scenes stuff. Like the, and it's not just featurette. It's not EPK stuff. Like, the documentary here is really a pretty extensive... Um, you know, about 40 minutes of a documentary. And then a bunch of other uh, featurettes from, you know, like Dances with Films, which is a cool little uh, festival that this thing premiered at. Uh, so, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a good, solid little genre movie. Well done. Vanessa Williams is in it. Michael Dorn is in it. Uh, it's worth checking. William Catt, yeah. Brittany Curran. You yeah. know, it's a lot. I mean, these are people who, who you know, aren't top-tier A-list anymore, but they, they give it a certain uh, credibility, and it's a Man from Earth Holocene. One thing about being uh, a journeyman uh, director, Richard, uh, yeah. been there, Pompatus of Love. John, oh, that's John, right. John, John Cryer film. Yeah. Uh, is you hang around long enough, you do a lot of TV, you run into people, you meet them. There you them, go. Uh, you know, yep. you, 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 you come up with a few thousand bucks or a few hundred thousand yeah. bucks to make a movie. You can make a few phone calls and, and suddenly you got a, that's a it. whole bunch of people hanging around your movie. Yep. Who aren't movie stars anymore, but they make your movie. Yeah, there they go. Okay. Novitiate. Uh, uh, Melissa Leo, very good in this movie. Yeah. A little bit surprised. You know, I'm surprised this didn't get a little more love during the awards that, season. That was one. Yeah. Uh, this is this is one too. You know, the, the, the movie itself, a few of the performances, particularly Militia. This movie is about uh, a young woman uh, who's who's uh, making that transition uh, uh, from postulant to novitiate. Uh, yeah. Doing that, uh, what I like to call this the scary era of the Catholic Church. Yeah. <laughs> Vatican II. Yep. <laughs> uh, and 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 uh, <laughs> what can I say? And uh, and it's and it's hard. It's tough, you know. And and uh, and Melissa Leo is this particular kind of reverend mother. And uh, and it's a, and it's a very piercing uh, film. Uh, and it's about that uh, that thing uh, for people who love God at that particular yeah. time in history too. I yeah. mean, this movie is is about these people, but it's about these people at this time. Yeah, because it's a very particular time in history. Anyway, special features include the uh, a commentary with uh, writer director Maggie Batts and some deleted scenes, and and an alternate ending. Ooh, yeah, right. Nice. I always love those. Uh, Darkest Hour. This is uh, it's one of the ones we've been talking about. Second or third of the uh, b- best pictures. To let's see what what else is already out. Dunkirk is out. Dunkirk get out. Is get out, out is out. out. Uh, sh- Lady is Lady Bird out. Lady Bird's not out, not yet. out yet. No. Yeah. So anyway, we now have Darkest Hour, uh, another best picture nominee, and uh, this is going to win best actor. I just don't see any any other way around it. Gary Oldman in the makeup. You don't even know it's makeup. He just, he becomes Churchill in the most impressive way imaginable. Uh, directed by Joe Wright, who of course did uh, Atonement, Atonement and uh, the, uh, what else he did? He did, uh, oh Joe. gosh, I'm losing, I'm, I'm forgetting the Jane Austen thing. Um, oh, Pride and Prejudice. Pride and Prejudice, thank yeah. you. Yeah. 
So anyway, Joe Wright's been around a long time, one of, another one of those fine directors who comes out of BBC television. And uh, this is, of course, the, the third Dunkirk movie of the year after their finest and Dunkirk. I don't know what <laughs> I don't know what was in the water that suddenly we're obsessed with Dunkirk, but your finest that could, that that tenth slot, yeah, that empty slot could have been should have been easily easily. I, I blame Lionsgate. Uh, anyway, uh, this is all about Churchill's moment uh, leading up to Dunkirk. The uh, you know that crisis moment when. Uh, he became prime minister, and, uh, and Chamberlain and Halifax were thinking that we could still have peace with the uh, with with Germany and all of this stuff. So a back lot of people in, back in from the wilderness, Churchill. A lot of people, yeah, came in back in from the wilderness. With it, with it, you know, you learn a little bit about Churchill's history as well, World War One and before that, and why a lot of people just didn't trust him. Uh, so it, it, there is a bit of an interesting history lesson here. A lot of people have dogpiled this movie for where it stretches the the the, the truth a little bit. Uh, and yes, I I understand. It is. It does feel. It strains credibility to believe that Churchill's big big moment came on a on a subway in the tube where a young <laughs> black man said something that really kind of look. I get it. You know, it's well, that, it, that, that whole little that whole little string with Henry. That was funny. Yeah, uh, yeah. I know. We went back and forth with Henry on this, and uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, I, that is that is a moment that strains credibility. But in the overall achievement of this film, it is forgivable because Winston, Gary Oldman is so good. Winston did good. He did. Winston did so, you know how I feel about biopics. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just enjoy the hell out of Gary Oldman in this thing. I just do. I just yeah. think it's like it's his crowning achievement. And, I'm and just... I, I have the ones that I forgive, too. I forgive Lincoln. Uh, yeah. Look, I'm an old history teacher. <laughs> uh, I do not. I, I would not show my 12th grade uh, or, for, for that matter, 7th grade history class yeah. that movie. No. Uh, be, and have them come well, away thinking that that has anything to do with history. Absolutely true. I mean, I remember very, very well the the conversations about uh, Lincoln in my high school history classes. And you know, I, we had two teachers that team taught two different the, the two classes together, and some really, really contentious lessons about mm. that. It's very interesting stuff. But um, yeah, this is, I mean, forget about the the liberties it takes. It's just it's a great clinic in acting with Gary Oldman and some really good stuff. And Joe Wright's a really fine director, and it's beautifully shot. And I always that's want enough. to see Michael Caine. Uh, he, he's too old. Uh, yeah. But you know, Michael yeah. Caine in the day with the right with the you know, with, with the, the right, right makeup? makeup. Oh man, he would have he would have killed it. Michael right? Caine would have just yeah. killed it. But you know, whatever. So you get a movies anywhere uh, digital copy on here to add to your movies anywhere library, and uh, you also get a commentary with Joe Wright, which is very erudite. The erudite Joe Wright. Uh, Gary Oldman featurette on uh, how they made him into Churchill, and then uh, another little kind of uh, mini historical featurette. Not a lot of stuff. I'm sure there may be a, a special edition in the offing at some point, but not uh, not likely anytime soon. And by the way, w- email us at gods at digigods.com, gods at digigods.com, about your use of movies anywhere. We are curious to find out. Uh, how many of you out there were using Disney movies anywhere, and how many were on ultraviolet, and if you've transitioned, and how you like the transition, and uh, and what uh, what you do or don't like about what you may or may not have lost from the other uh, services, because things changed up a little bit, mm. and they are not being very communicative with me. They really don't want to uh, to talk about movies anywhere and its plans going forward. They've been very very cagey, and uh, I'm I think I have a, I have a theory as to why, but I'd like to hear from our listeners. Uh, your feelings, and by all means, go onto the uh, Facebook page as well and start a thread. Uh, that would certainly open it up to the community discussion. Uh, and otherwise, be, make sure you visit us at cinegods.com, where we've got a bunch of great new pieces. You had oh. a terrific one on Black Panther. Yeah, the Black Panther piece. Uh, and Mark has a new review. And uh, uh, yeah, Mark has a Red Sparrow up yeah. there, which sounds interesting. And yeah. Annihilation, I think. Is, yeah. So a lot of good stuff going on. on a lot of good stuff. A lot of good stuff. Uh, speaking of Disney, uh, the multi-screen edition of Coco, Disney yeah. Pixar's Coco. Look, this movie was a perfectly lovely movie. Um, interesting also that, you know, I mean, but for the songs yeah. and, and a few things like that, that, we're not talking about it. Again, in that, in that, in that slot, dude. Yeah. You know, why not? I mean, yeah. am I wrong? I, you know what? I mean, I, I could have seen Coco pop in there. I, I'm not as big a Coco fan as everybody else. And I, I feel... I feel like I want to hide because because Claudia will beat me up if I say that. <laughs> she was, she was very, the, the, it's but, the music that got me. 
Yeah. In the movie. It's a very clever movie. I'm not going to ruin it. I mean, I, I, everybody's probably already seen it. And, and frankly, the way it sort of works, obviously, there's the cultural stuff. Okay, so let's yeah. go there first. The cult, yeah. Just like Black, Black Panther. Sure. There's this sure. cultural stuff in the movie that's very important. And day, I love day the way the they dead. sort of lay it all out. You know, it, the story of this, the, the Day of the Dead and and this little kid and, uh, and you know, his... music is banned in his family and he doesn't know why because he's very musical and... Yeah, and, you know, looking for his father and, and his heritage and, you know, going into the land of the dead and this sort of mystical journey. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of really imaginative stuff here. What those uh, altars are all about. I mean, I, 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 I got to tell you, I did not understand what those altars were all about. I mean, yeah. I thought that I knew they were religious, but yeah. I didn't know they, they were very specifically about that connection. Yeah, I, I and, and and what's weird is I have these altars uh, al- altars all over my house. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous, and I didn't even know I was doing it. it I, I my my issues with Coco have more to do with with Pixar formulaity. Yeah, which is is that even a word formulaity? It is now, baby. Okay, so uh, you know that they're just if you've seen enough Pixar movies, and in this case, I'm you know Toy Story kind of went into the back of my head, and I was mm-hmm. looking at it like all. Oh, I know what you're going to do. You're going to do a thing with the thing, and then you're going to thing back yeah. on the thing with the thing. And sure enough, they did. Yeah. And yeah. it's just because I've seen so many Pixar movies, I just know the mechanics of it now. I, oh, I, no, I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that point, yeah. 100%. The, the, they, they live in a world, even the look, just the actual look. Yeah. You know, it, the, literally, if you've seen a Pixar movie, you've seen a Pixar movie. Yeah. Uh, all they ever get is a little bit more resolved uh, and refined. Yes. That said, lovely songs in this movie, uh, Golden Globe uh, winner sure. uh, for Best Motion Picture. Yeah. Uh, hours and hours of bonus materials, deleted scenes, even more music, blah, 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 blah. Yep. It's Coco. Yep. And then a uh, little uh, straight-to-video movie called Resolution Song, funded by uh, Urban Styles, directed by Antonio James, written by Deborah Capstone. Uh, this is a sweet little movie. It's, uh, you know, no no name actors in it but and not made for a whole lot of money, but uh, definitely pretty solidly put together. Uh, about a uh, kind of a Romeo and Juliet type romance. Um, about a black family and a young kid who falls in love with the white girl next door, and it it doesn't go where you normally think these movies would go. It doesn't. Uh, it it gets into. It's not focused on you know the culture clash as it is on matters of faith and family. And it's it's you know it's not a faith based film, but mm. it kind of flirts with being one of those. It's it's a it's it's definitely original, and uh, I like the casting very very much. Um, Lester Spate, Tori Hart. Uh, Cedric Williams, Ella Joyce. It's a it's a good bunch of people. I like that movie. Those are all wonderful actors. Yep. Those two young actors are very good. It's conscious of its of of its subject matter a yeah. little bit, uh, and I mean, you know, and that is the subject. Yeah. Uh, but it would have been a little a little bit more clever if it had. If made, it weren't so, guess yeah. who's coming to dinner? Yeah. You yeah. Know, just 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 <laughs> make yeah. the movie because you know it's not 1966. Um, Rob Reiner's <laughs> Rob Reiner's LBJ film. Oh dear. You know, and the thing that this film does have to offer is Woody Harrelson's performance. I'll give it that. Yeah. Woody Woody, Woody kicks ass in this film. Yeah. He, he to me, to my mind, he's Gary Oldman good. Unfortunately yeah. the whole rest of the film yeah, that's it. isn't you know you know what I mean and yeah. that's always a bugaboo when you when you have a moment like this, uh where you you know I mean there there, there are a few good performances. Bill Pullman's good in this movie. It, mistake here, Cradle of Grey. More or less a Cradle of Grey yeah. uh, a biopic of yeah. LBJ. Uh, I'm sorry, dude. I I can't. I'm trying to think of when I've seen a good Cradle of Grave pulled off. The only the only ones that I can think of that that come close. The Last Emperor, yeah, so, more or less yeah. did it. Um, but it did it with big ellipses. Yeah. You know, you really jump through, and a lot of it's flashbacks. So, uh, but other than that, I I can think of very few that that really made that work. All they all, I guess Ray did it a little bit, but it didn't need to. Yeah. But on balance, you, you don't need to do that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 I guess when we first meet Ray, he's a little, he's a little but kid. But the next thing we know, he's, you know. You see, yeah, he's uh, Jamie Foxx. So, so, <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. So, but, but, you know, so Rob Reiner, I don't know, it didn't, didn't quite work for me. Um, and it's funny because I was just, I was talking about making stuff up in movies. Rob Reiner put a black FBI agent in, in, uh, in Mississippi, Mississippi Burn- Burning. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it, Rob, but I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> not, not Jay Echo Hoover's. FBI. Anyway, anyway, this movie, uh, 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 Richard Jenkins is in it. Richard Jenkins, of course, is in The Shape of Water, so he got his uh, acknowledgement over there. Uh, Jennifer Jason Lee is in it. Uh, Jeffrey Donovan is actually pretty good in it. It's not a great movie, but anyway, but the you know the history is is, is interesting 
uh, if nothing else. Not a lot on this in terms of special features either, I'm afraid. And we are into docs. We've got a ton of docs that have uh, accumulated. So we've got uh, we got a real chock a block doc. Yeah, uh, chock a block doc block to go through. Uh, Steve McQueen, American Icon, the untold true story of the spiritual quest of a Hollywood legend. So uh, there was a Steve McQueen doc uh, about a year or so ago on Le Mans. Yeah. Uh, man, man, yeah, man, man in Le Mans. Mans. Steve yeah. McQueen, Man in the Le Mans. Making of that movie. Yeah, the Making of Le Mans, which is uh, as much about Steve McQueen and his celebrity and his career generally as anything else, but focused primarily on the obsession of Le Mans, which is a movie that really didn't have a script. It was just Steve McQueen wanting to capture the the essence of racing in a movie. Who was the director that quit? It lost its first director. Oh, that's movie. right. Yeah, um, and Steve took over. Uh, it, it was uh, oh um it, the uh, 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 John Sturgis yes 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 John yes, Sturgis yes, was yes. the yeah so uh, in any case this this is a much broader portrait I'm not sure that it's as good uh, McQueen is a fascinating figure I mean he really is he's just kind of the you know there's a certain um, quality to some movie stars from a prior generation where they were just you know they were hellraisers whether it was John Wayne or Errol Flynn whoever they were. Young um, James Dean. James Dean. They just they had a life Young with Mom, cars and Brando. Brando. They things just things. they 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 lived fast and hard. And certainly all those British guys as well. You yeah. know, uh, Bert, Bates and Burton and Bates, Bates and Harris. Yeah, um, we don't really have that anymore. They're, they're, I, the, Tom Cruise might have been the last one. Tom Cruise you know, is kind of the last with, one. With the pilot sure. license and all that. Yeah. And, 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 yeah, motorcycles. And, motorcycles. Harrison Ford was certainly kind of in that yeah. of that of that ilk as well. So we don't really have them anymore. Uh, the 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 Hellraisers and the Daredevils. So in that respect, McQueen is is quite interesting. But um, the what's interesting here is the. Uh, the kind of the the spiritual aspect of this, and uh, that's a part of him that has never really been explored. I'm not sure that this explores it sufficiently. Um, pa- Pastor Greg Laurie, who is sort of the, um, the the spiritual figure in his life in this, uh, has a special message that's included on this. He is still alive, and uh, Gary Sinise does the narration very uh, adeptly. So. Um, you know, I I would I would say uh, apart from the fact that it feels a tiny bit self serving from the standpoint of uh, Pastor Greg, uh, it still contributes nicely to the the lore of Steve McQueen. But the Le Mans doc is a better film. Mm. Interesting stuff. I got a couple over here. Yeah. Uh, including Tell Them We Are Rising, which is a film that happened to be... That's really good. A really, really good film, uh, uh, the PBS. uh, It it happened to be a part of the Mendocino Film Festival, whatever year it was. I guess it was last year that I was on the jury there, and there were several of these films. This one is about uh, historically uh, black colleges, HBCUs in the South, where they came from, uh, where they're going now. 150 years. Uh, and it's a very, very interesting film. We look at, we talk to a lot of the presidents of the colleges, so they get into the history, uh, the history of them all. One of the things that I liked about this film is that it laid out very clearly how, uh, while we always think of these colleges as of having been started uh, by very in, important uh, black figures in the community, you your W. E. B. Du Bois is. Uh, Tuskegee Institutes and all this kind of stuff. Very often, it was white. Very often, Jewish yeah. members of these southern communities did who did, financed did it, fina- don't, donated patronized land, it, patronized yeah. it for years and years and years. And sometimes we forget that yeah. uh, that that was this very particular sort of connection. Yeah, there uh, was there was one specifically about that uh, last year as well. A doc yeah. specifically about I forget which uh, which benefactor, but yeah, it was it's good stuff. So good stuff. So check that out if you get a chance. Um, uh, I forget the filmmaker's name uh, on that film. Oh, uh, uh, Stanley Nelson. Stanley Nelson is the name of that filmmaker. And we have I Am Somebody, three films by Madeline Anderson, an extraordinary uh, filmmaker from the 60s, 70s. Uh, black woman making documentary films in the 60s is just uh, uh, an, an, an amazing thing in and of itself. She managed to pull this off, and she managed to do it quite well. Uh, so hard to make documentaries in the 60s, in too, the 60s because you're, all, yeah. it's, it, there are no video cameras and, and edit on Final Cut. It's, and, and, and she worked in the sort of the style of the Maisel, uh, the, the Maisleys. Uh, yeah. you know, that's, I mean, real fly-on-the-wall cinema verite yeah. sort of thing. Uh, these, these films here, Integration Report 1, 1960, 
a tribute to Malcolm X, 1967, and I Am Somebody, 1970. Uh, basically, films all about uh, the, the fight for civil rights, the civil rights movement, seen through the eye, though, through the lens of a black woman, which is a very particular thing, and it's what this film does, uh, these films do. Uh, extraordinary footage that you will not have seen anywhere, anywhere else. Anywhere else. Yeah. Anywhere else. yeah. Uh, my Art is uh, from Film Movement. This is a documentary by Laurie Simmons. And, uh, Love Laurie. It, it's, it, you know, she's, she's not Laurie Anderson. She's no, the other Laurie. The other she's Laurie. the other visual yeah. artist yeah. Laurie. And um, it is, it's a, kind of a, a series of, of movie homages. Her particular artistic style, her, her you know, photographic image style applied to uh, classic icon iconography from other movies. And um, it's very clever. It's uh, really kind of cute at times. And, uh, you know, if you're, if you're not familiar with her work, and she does a commentary here, which will get you caught up in a heartbeat if you're not, um, it, you, get a, it, you, you get the vibe very quickly. It's a lot of fun. It's really a, it's a very, very fun journey. Uh, and, yeah, it's, you know, she's celebrating her own work, and uh, it blows by really quickly. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's fun. You'll, if you know movies, you'll recognize everything that she's doing, and you'll, you'll just feel the love coming out. It's great. Uh, and I have another one about an extraordinary artist, Tyrus, Tyrus Wong, um, uh, who, Bambi, uh, worked for Walt Disney, worked on uh, Warner Brothers cartoons, um, uh, just, just an extraordinary, it came to the United States. Real legend. The United States the, Real legend. Yeah, Angel Eye at the age of nine. It suffered all of the depreditudes you can imagine of a Chinese, a young Chinese uh, person. But he could, he could paint. Uh, and he became a very noted and famous Hollywood sketch artist, in addition to all of the work that he d did for Walt Disney and for Jack Warner. Um, worked on Rubber Without a Car. Just a fantastic thing. Uh, the Wild Bunch, Peck Park. Just, you know, really a noted, noticed artist. Another PBS documentary here uh, featuring Tyrus Wong, uh, written and directed by Pamela Tom. A couple of docs that are movie-based, European movie-based here. The first one is Behind the White Glasses, Lena Wertmuller, Behind the White Glasses. This is by Valerio Ruiz. Um, and this is a, a release from Kino Lorber, which goes kind of hand-in-hand -hand with the Blu-rays of the Wertmuller films that they've been releasing. Straight-up look at the uh, life and career of Lena Wertmuller, who was the first uh, woman ever nominated for Best Director at the Academy Awards for her film Seven Beauties, which is still amazing. And uh, you know, if, if you she she's just uh, such a such. A, I mean, she started as an assistant to Fellini, became this huge uh, icon in Italian cinema, and has since continued to be really incredibly unpredictable and uh, impossible to define. And uh, if you if you don't know her career, or her films, you will want to see them after seeing this. Uh, you know, there's there's not a lot by way of extras, but really just a, a wonderful, loving documentary about somebody who's not been uh, discussed as much as her movies, and that's a shame. Yeah. And then uh, on a more scholarly level is another one from Kino Lorber from Caligari to Hitler: German Cinema in the Age of the Masses. Uh, you know, I wrote a piece for the LA Times some years ago when there was like a momentary resurgence in German film here, things like Mostly Martha and Das Experiment, and uh, it felt like German cinema, thanks to some of their uh, their, ta their regional tax credits, was getting a kind of a kick in the pants, and then that evaporated when all those directors came to Hollywood and <laughs> made bad movies here that went nowhere, and then they went back to Germany, and you know, there's it just it all kind of fell apart. Which, by the way, the director of Mostly Martha predicted at the time. Yeah. She was she her. I remember her comments to me was like, "Why are you making a thing out of this? I hate working in Germany. It's horrible. And I want to I want to leave. <laughs> why, why are you even writing this piece? There's nothing going on there." I was like, "Well, but I like all these movies." She's like, "Okay, whatever. I'll play. I'll, I'll play ball." It was it was hysterical how kind of bitter she was. And well, then she's, of course she's they, trying to get a deal over on the Sony lot. Yeah. Then they wound up remaking Mostly Martha in the worst possible way. <laughs> yeah. It's horrible with uh, Aaron Eckhart and uh, and uh, what uh, today, yeah. Catherine Zeta Jones. Anyway, Caligari to Hitler um, is much more scholarly, and it and it goes back to it basically is based on the um, the idea put forward after World War II that you can look at the Weimar films from the silent period and see the cultural roots that would, of course, give birth mm. to Nazism and Hitler and totalitarianism, that that was all sort of festering. 
which of course is not a new idea. I mean, uh, even even my grandfather, uh, my mother would tell me that he even said, you know, after the uh, the Treaty of Versailles, that this is this is going to make things worse. You yeah. know, it, it was just so punitive that it left the country devastated and easily manipulated by a by a madman, which and, of course is exactly what happened. And when there was a vulnerable population there to be yeah. pointed at and blamed. There you go. And, 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 Absolutely, and, and those six million Jews. So, in any case, this is uh, this this pursues that thesis and examines a lot of these films. And they're all films that you've heard of. They're all you know Fritz Long movies and Murnau movies. Uh, you know, uh, Metropolis, and and uh, it gets it, it gets very intensely into the period. I, I think sometimes they they uh, rope things in that shouldn't be roped in. They're seeing things that probably don't really exist. Nonetheless, it is uh, it is provocative and it is uh, very interesting. And uh, if you are a fan of that particular moment in time and these films, I think you will find this uh, quite uh, quite impressive. Uh, the Coming War on China is a John Pilger film. John Pilger is a documentarian who's been making documentaries for 50, 60 years. Long time, yeah. Uh, some of them not bad. Some of them a bit didactic and uh, I don't know, um, overreaching, I think. This one yeah. is about the coming war in China. What he's done is uh, take a look at uh, the, the sort of um, American uh, nuclear facilities that sort of ring uh, the, the Pacific Rim, the sort of uh, South yeah. Pacific Rim. And, um, and uh, as he looks at what's going on in China and South Korea and some of the other places where nuclear uh, detonations, nuclear weapons have been tested uh, more recently. Of course, we haven't tested the nuclear weapons here in the United States or around the United States in, uh, in several, several decades, even around the world for that matter. So anyway, uh, he has a fear that there is a coming war on China, thus the title of this documentary. Um, I don't know. Um, I think that it might be a somewhat overreaching. Uh, but he's a he's a noted filmmaker uh, who's made some very powerful films in the past. Well, you know... Um... I hope he means trade war. I could I could live with that. <laughs> Mushroom clouds uh, on no. the cover there. I'm afraid. That uh, really, really interesting doc. Uh, Insei, the power of intuition. This is a, uh, a an Icelandic documentary about the Icelandic concept of insei, which means intuition. Uh, in a very ancient Icelandic concept. And uh, this is not just localized in Iceland, of course. The, the idea here is that in our modern technological world, uh, we are losing touch. We're relying on too many things that are concrete, uh, technology and research and Google and this and that and the other thing, and missing the power of our own intuition, that there is something inside that sometimes knows better than than mm. anything else, mm. and that that in and we're losing touch with that that little that little in, inner inner motor that uh, guides us purely by intuition. Um, and they go, they talk to everybody, you know, religious people, artists, uh, they, they you know, scientific figures, and it is uh, it's a really cool, very imaginative, well done doc. Uh, I know you think it might think it's like a kind of a pretentious abstract idea how do you make a documentary about intuition uh how do you make people sit for nearly 90 minutes just talking about intuition you do it's really interesting and it's gonna it's very provocative and it will make you want to get more in touch with your own intuition which cannot possibly be a bad thing that's on blu-ray and they've got a lot of really cool animations in here that just they pop on the blu-ray it's beautiful so that is in say the power of intuition from kino lorber interesting stuff there conduct Every move counts. Five young conductors' journey to greatness begins. It's really a competition, is what this film is about. A documentary about a, con a competition. As uh, five these five young conductors uh, engage in this international conductors' competition in Frankfurt. Um, so conducting, uh, we're talking about uh, orchestras now. Uh, yeah. uh, standing there, the guy with the baton. Yeah, which is uh, something I uh, admire, even though I don't understand it. My little brother, my, my younger brother, yeah. I got to stop calling him my little brother. He's like fifty five years old. <laughs> uh, my, is uh, 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 a master choral conductor and a, and a few other things. You know, nice. He's really a jazz musician, but you know he's done this. And I used to always ask him when I was a kid, because you know, I was always in jazz band. Yeah. You know, and you'd have a guy standing up there, and he and, 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 and he just sort of like be bebopping, but I didn't really pay that much attention to the band, <laughs> yeah. which is probably why I was like fourth chair all the time, because I wasn't paying that much attention. I just asked my brother, 
what the hell is the guy with the stick doing up there? And, and, and he's like, see, that's why you're fourth chin. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> you're not paying attention. Anyway, this is about that and that and this competition. Between these people who, when you, when you start working at the, this height – uh, in, in, in these fields. These people all know each other. They're sort of friends, yet they're engaged in this competition, which is going to mean something very important to their lives. If you think about it, there are only so many world-class uh, orchestras around the world. True. Uh, so, um, five, you know, there are five people in this competition. One of them is going to get a job someplace, yeah. and the other ones are not. Yeah. Uh, and so it gets very intense, and it means a lot. And it is about musical ability and talent, but a lot of it has to do with personality, too. And once I did figure out what those maestros are actually doing up there, mm-hmm. and that if you actually pay attention to them, you can play with the rest of the orchestra. You know, <laughs> you, you know, you know, you know, when I really first started paying attention to what an actual conductor does, is that episode of Happy Days where Fonzie's <laughs> alone with the baton and he starts pretending like he's conducting the orchestra? I thought that was awesome. So, yeah, that's crazy. Anyway, it's a neat movie uh, about a world that you don't always, that we don't always get a chance to delve into. So, check it out. So, uh, a couple Teddy Roosevelt things here. Uh, He's on the cover of both of these Blu rays. In one of them, he's on the cover just because there's a picture of Mount Rushmore. Uh, It's the 12 part documentary, America's Treasures. Which is from Mill Creek, and it's just all about it's a it's a trot across America from sea to shining sea. All of these like twenty five national monuments, uh, which all began again with Teddy Roosevelt's Antiquities Act of nineteen oh six, where you know you you they wanted to preserve the the heritage of the country in these rare and unique uh, ecological or uh, anthropomor- anthropological locations. Yeah. Um, it's great. I mean, it's just a wonder. It's it's just wonderful. It is great on Blu-ray, and the photography is fantastic. And you you go to the Grand Canyon, and you go to the the Sierras, and you just you just it's it's amazing. You forget sometimes what an amazing country this is because most of us just sort of live in a city and we go back and forth, and you yeah. don't take time to explore this country. And damn it, I'm going to do that. Yeah, and you, you know, particularly particularly. Look, I'm from the Midwest. I'm from St. Louis. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, the Midwest is the Midwest, but St. Louis is a city. You know, Chicago. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's it's so you know it's so I think. And I got to tell you, it blew me away how many places in my home state of Missouri yeah. I never went to. I know. You know, uh, and, and I've been living here now for almost thirty years. And I there's still places in my home state of Missouri I've never been to. I didn't even go to the Salton Sea until my wife was in a bicycle race with my <laughs> nephews. And we all went down there a few years ago for the for the the big bike race, you know, around the Salton Sea. And I thought to myself, you know what? I don't really miss the Salton Sea. Yeah. Uh, it's a disgusting place. It does smell. Uh, fun. Have fun with your meth. <laughs> but and, you know, you got, you got a chance to take a look. So anyway, we'll and then we also have the indomitable Teddy Roosevelt by Harrison Engel. Uh, this is a Flickr Alley Blu-ray. Flickr Alley has uh, has really they just keep outdoing themselves. It's really amazing. Uh, I, I did not realize that when Teddy Roosevelt was elected as the 26th president, he was, at that moment, the youngest president ever elected. Did at you that know moment, that? At I, that moment? I, don't know. I, I always associate that with uh, John Kennedy. Yeah. Until, but, uh, until Barack, of course. Well, but, but, yeah. it was, at, the but time, at that moment, he was, at the, that moment, he was the youngest, mm. which is weird because I don't look at Teddy Roosevelt and go, oh, look how young he is. No, not he like just, we did with John Kennedy. No. He, what that basically tells me is not that we elected a young guy. It tells me we were, up until that point, electing a lot of old bastards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what that was telling me. Made in 1983, uh, narrated by George C. Scott. Uh, you, this is basically just a, a, a tribute to Roosevelt using lots of amazing archival footage, beautifully rendered on Blu-ray here. And um, it's uh, it, I think a lot of this stuff, even though we think we've seen all the footage you can see of Teddy Roosevelt, you, you haven't. It's it's pretty amazing. So uh, you know, we we I have a lot of mixed feelings about Teddy Roosevelt, but this is uh, this is quite an amazing uh, amazing yeah. documentary. The uh, Independent Lens did this really neat series uh, called Copyright Criminals. Um, um, it was starting about ten years ago, mm-hmm. actually, yeah, yeah, about eight or nine years ago, and it's a really really neat series that looks at um, basically the use of sampling uh, over the course of the well the uh, the history of the uh, hip hop. Uh, movement, right? So sampling, hip-hop artists, DJs, uh, take these bits and pieces 
of uh, previously recorded mu mu uh, music from songs, and they use it, and then they rap over it, and they, they loop it, and they do all kinds of things with it. And um, it, we used to just call that, you know, borrowing, borrowing uh, the break. And, uh, you know, when, when record companies and all that got involved, this became copyright infringement. And a, a lot of battles have been fought about this, Chuck D and others. Uh, this particular uh, two-disc set is the Funky Drummer edition of copyright infringement. So like when you l you're listening to music, particularly hip hop music, but frankly any music nowadays, uh, and you hear these uh, commercials in television, movie, these, these beats, these sort of riffs, very often these riffs were created by actual drummers. My dad was a drummer, so this is like a big deal to me, right? And guys like Clyde Stubblefield yeah. and everything. And, and, and these riffs, these beats, these breaks become known and used over and over and over again. And these guys, these you who created this this music, right? Yeah. These these pair, not a cent, not a dime. Oh, that's awful. Uh, and that and that's just the way that's been going on for for a while now. So this is an interesting uh, series of documentaries about the sub about that subject. This particular one is about the drummers. On this to this set, though, you do get all kinds of fabulous stuff, uh, the documentary itself, plus all kinds of video remixes uh, featuring some of the music that these guys have created. Plus, uh, they talk to you know the, the, the DJs who are sort of try, trying to make the case for it. But I got to tell you, they miss me every now and again uh, when making the case for this, particularly as I produce a lot of music and I want people to pay me for it. Yeah. Um, Chuck D, D La Soul, George Clinton, Mixmaster, Mike, DJ Spooky, CeeLo Green, all those wow. voices oh, talking about how to The question being, hey, can you, they, they say, uh, you know, can you own uh, uh, sound? Yeah. Of course, which is. It's, it's, it's a disingenuous question. Yeah. It's not about owning the sound. It's about owning that sound put together that way. Uh, and that, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, that's the question. And, and, and we can sue your ass over it. That's, what, that's, that's the answer. Well, here's a question then. You, if you can't own sound, can you own silence? Ooh. Digi uh, digital silence. In Pursuit of Silence is a really, really interesting philosophical documentary by a documentarian named Patrick Shen. Uh, this uh, premiered, I believe, at South by Southwest. This is from Cinema Guild. And uh, this is really a, a really interesting idea, and uh, it'll make you think. The idea here is that, uh, that, that what impact does noise and sound have on us psychologically, mm. physiologically, and so forth? And um, there have been things, you know, I've been reading a lot of stuff lately that says everybody would be physiologically better off if we had more silence. If you had just some meditative silence every day, 10 minutes without any sound, we forget how l loaded with sound the world is. Particularly, Did you know that, particularly artificial sounds. Particularly artificial sounds, for sure. Did you know that Mumbai is the loudest city on the planet? I did not know that. No, but you know now that's that pretty. Damn, it. I've I've been in Manhattan. Yeah. If, if Mumbai is louder than Manhattan, that's pretty damn loud. Yeah. I mean that's that that that's crazy. So uh, yeah, I mean it's it's really a, a kind of an amazing um, uh, sort of global journey based on the topic of sound, and it is it asks a lot of really imco important questions. It has a bunch of extras in here, stuff that didn't make it into the final film, and some ex uh, sequences that are extended, and some other stuff that just kind of juices up the extras. But it is a provocative concept. And uh, that leads me to the somewhat related, but be not, not entirely, but it's, it's just a beautiful film, uh, Earth, One Amazing Day, narrated by Robert Redford. This is from BBC Earth, and uh, they released this sucker on a 4K Blu-ray that is just not to be believed. Watch this on the most beautiful set you possibly can. It, it will just blow your mind. This is a single day uh, on Earth, and it, you're going through the entire planet. You're covering the entire planet. This is just one of those unbelievably well-planned nature documentaries where you just think, uh, I can't even fathom logistically how they put this thing together. Um, you just go everywhere. You go every corner of the globe and all these great animals and beautiful natural wonders and uh, whales and penguins. And it's just, it, it, it really blows your mind. And uh, again, it's one of those things like the Monuments Dock where you just think, I don't get out enough. Wow. But I'm not going to go to Antarctica or the middle of the Pacific. Well, it's interesting that with this, this uh, polluting paradise, a, 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 a dock uh, from Fatih. 
Aiken. Yes. Fati, of course, being a narrative filmmaker. Yes. The, 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 the Edge of Heaven. Just wonderful. A lot of great films. Uh, uh, films head on and all that. So, so this is the doc that he did. Um, he's he's an expatriate uh, Turk who lives in Germany. Yep. Uh, but he went but he went home uh, back to Turkey's Black Sea to a small village there where some of his family is from, and uh, and he documented the chronicled the struggles of the villagers there uh, from uh, the the the. Decision of the government to 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 turn their community basically into a gigantic garbage dump, uh, the outskirts of the community anyway, and how that is affecting uh, this beautiful community where they drew uh, grew all kinds of wonderful uh, 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 olive trees and it's just a beautiful beautiful film. So he he made a little film about it, uh, relatively speaking, his hometown. So great doc, and I suppose you can extrapolate from it to other communities all over the world in the decisions that we make about what we're going to do with our garbage, man, um, which is it's true. You know, it's a thing, you know. It I is. Mean, what are we going to do with our garbage? When I was a kid, you were a kid. Yeah. Certainly when I was a kid. Uh, we burned a lot of our garbage. In the Midwest, uh, this time of year, we would be burning leaves. Uh, we'd burn garbage. Yeah. I mean, literally houses. With, in, with incinerators. With incinerators. And, Homes had incinerators yeah. out back. Uh, of course, we had to stop doing that because we uh, <laughs> And garbage dumps became the thing, landfills. Yeah. And the idea was we're supposed to create these landfills, and then we're going to build these communities on top of these landfills. That way we would always be – Yeah, that, that hasn't happened. That didn't, that didn't work out. <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, I don't know, man. What are we going to do with all uh, that garbage? That's a, a great question, uh, and I don't have an answer. Got three uh, music-themed titles here, two Blu-ray, one uh, DVD. Colin Hanks, son of Tom, uh, did the documentary Eagles of Death Metal, uh, Nos Amis, our friends in parentheses, Eagles of Death Metal, from Shout Select. And um, this is basically the in the wake of the 2015 uh, Paris terrorist attack at the, uh, the Bataclan Theater, where Eagles of Death Metal were, were performing, uh, this revisits the band after that, and uh, you know we forget 130 people around Paris were killed on on that day. It's just yeah. horrible, and um, uh, this is you know this talks to people who survived the attack, and it talks to the band, and uh, it it sort of revisits the whole moment, but in a really life affirming way. I don't think they're a very good band. It's not my style of music, but uh, given the context, I certainly was appreciative of it. Um, similarly, uh, as far as politics and, and music, is uh, Act and Punishment, The Pussy Riot Trials. This is on DVD. If you are not familiar, uh, Pussy Riot is the, the all-girl punk band in Russia who has been a real thorn in the side of the authorities. Uh, yeah. And, you know, they were, they were put in jail about seven years ago. And um, did that whole that whole protest in the church that yeah. was considered sacrilegious, and it's um, you know finally they they wound up sort of uh, speaking out in force at the Sochi Olympics. It's all it's all quite fascinating, and I only followed this story in bits and pieces, but but this doc puts it all together and really gives you the timetable and the timeline and um, puts some personalities to the faces. It's very interesting. Uh, and then the last of the three music ones here is the uh, 20th anniversary edition of the famous grunge documentary, Hype. Uh, this is the collector's edition from Sh Shot Select on Blu-ray. I have a bit of a connection to this because Hype was directed by the very fine documentarian Doug Prey, mm -hmm. who was a graduate student when I was undergrad, and uh, he was in the producer's program which I investigated when I thought that I might go to graduate school for a minute, and they said, oh, you got to go talk to Doug. I was like, who's Doug? <laughs> oh, Doug Doug is the guy in the producer's program. I was like, okay, all right. So I went and talked to Doug, and he's just totally mellow, totally cool, very soft-spoken, wasn't really encouraging, wasn't really discouraging. This is what we do. This is what I'm doing, and uh, good. Best of luck to you. That's, yeah. that's, uh, that, was, that was his whole deal. So anyway, I had, a, I had a moment with him before he took off as a documentarian. But uh, Hype is really the definitive film about the grunge movement. Lots of great extras in here, including an audio commentary with Doug Prey. And, uh, you know, it, this is the definitive doc about that. And, and this is the uh, 20th anniversary edition of it on Blu-ray. Definitely want to get it if you are a fan of Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Soundgarden and, uh, you know, all the rest of them. And a lot of them here that I'd never even heard of. Yeah, interesting stuff.
Uh, the Skyjacker's Tale, uh, an extremely interesting historical documentary. This is a period that has always been fascinating to me. I can, I can remember this period, most of these things. I was a yeah. young kid when a lot of this stuff was going on. You remember all the hijackings oh, back yeah. in the day here. Yeah. This doesn't happen anymore. Doesn't it, you know, you know, it's, it, it's, it, it's funny how these things sort of fall out of the national memory. Yeah. You know, and, and be, there, are, there are people that, you know, like we know who will yeah. never have lived in a period when that was a regular occurrence, event, occurrence yeah. in yeah. the United States. And yeah. so they, when something happens, they find, oh, my God, can you believe that happened? I'm like, yeah, it happened in 1973. What's <laughs> wrong with you? <laughs> you know, well, you know, I was born in well, 1998. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, this, in, in, in 1972 on the island of St. Uh, Croy in uh, the Virgin Islands uh, on a golf uh, course, uh, there were eight murders. Uh, a, a group of men uh, uh, were taken c- c- custody and convicted of these murders and went to prison. One of them was a guy named, his, his name was Ismail Labit at the time, but it has since become Ishmael Muslim Ali, right? Mm. So uh, he protested, said he was a political prisoner, that he didn't commit these murders. He was in prison for several years. Um, he eventually, uh, through by hook or by crook, he managed to escape from prison uh, hijack an airplane and fly to Cuba, where he has Crazy. been ever since. That yeah. all happened in 1984. So the murders were 72. He did this in 1984, and uh, he's been in Cuba ever since. And this director, Jamie K- yeah, Kasner, got yeah. an interview with him. That's pretty amazing. Uh, and, 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 it's, and it's quite an interesting story. The history of it is all, you know, I, you, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to speak to what he did or didn't do. May very well have done everything that he's accused of. It's kind of hard to tell. But the history of all of these events is fascinating. interesting. Absolutely it's fascinating. fascinating stuff, man. Yeah. Anyway, uh, The Skyjacker's Tale. A couple of interesting docs on Blu-ray as well. One was uh, the, the Keddy was in the awards mix a little bit last year. Yeah. It didn't, didn't really uh, catch fire. But um, Keddy is a, uh, a Turkish documentary about the street cats of Istanbul. And apparently there are a hell of a lot of them. Yeah. And it's a thing and has been for for generations. And it's just something people accept as like, oh, these are yeah, we're this is Istanbul. We got we got a lot of wild cats in the city, which would freak me out. Yeah. Because I lived in a city in France that had a lot of wild cats roaming around the the, the bushes by the train station, and it wasn't charming. Yeah. No. <laughs> there was cats, nothing charming cats about poop, it. Poop all over everything. I suppose, I suppose it's not as bad as monkeys in uh, Morocco. True. <laughs> there we go. But these are domesticated animals yeah. that somehow got loose and reproduced, and now you're stuck with them. Yeah. You know, it's like 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 they're they're, they're quasi feral they're not feral they're not vicious some of yeah. them are supposed to they're they're, they're they're not afraid of people and they do expect you to take care of them yeah and the idea here is that somehow the cats are are a a represent they're some kind of a sort of a that they are tied to the, the social fabric in a yeah. in a very reflexive and meaningful way. I'm not sure I but really not buy re- that. Not 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 religious. Not like the cows. No, in, but it's in, sort of it's pi- it, we now sort of I, they're, they're, they've this been ubiquitous for so long that yeah. now it's part of our you yeah. know identity, which is a little bit weird. But still, it's a it's a fun film and uh, Seda Torin, a very fine documentarian, that is from Oscilloscope on Blu-ray. And then we also have Red Trees by Marina Willer. Uh, which uh, is this is from Cohen Media, and uh, this deals specifically with uh, Jewish identity and Jewish uh, memory and mm-hmm. genealogy. Specifically, uh, as the filmmaker Marina Willer, she, it's it's her family's journey that she's investigating here, and um, her family was one of only twelve that survived the occupation of Prague. Mm-hmm. One of only twelve Jewish families that survived the occupation of Tra- Prague. And uh, so she wants to reconnect with that, mm-hmm. and uh, through her heritage, and talk to the people who you know were there and who might remember. And uh, it's a it's 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 quite a quite a penetrating examination because it's not just her family. You do feel like it's your family the way mm-hmm. that she constructs this. It's very very good. Uh, she offers an interview. I wish she'd have done a commentary, but there's an interview with her and a trailer. And uh, at 80 minutes, it moves very very briskly. Very quickly. Uh, let's see. We're out of time here, so let's just uh, knock off a couple more real quickly. Um, Nasser's Republic, The Making of Modern Egypt, uh, narrated by Haim Abbas. 
is a film by Michelle Goldman, which is really, really worth seeing if you are uh, compelled by this history of it. I'm very compelled by this. Our, our friend uh, Nadim George, who has uh, uh, stepped on this show a couple of times as a guest and a co-host, uh, Nadim is, is, was born in Egypt mm. under Nasser, or, or grew up partly under Nasser, and it's, uh, so I, I've heard a little bit of the history uh, through him and his family. And it is, you know, Nasser, of course, was the, the Egyptian dictator who wanted to create a pan-Arabic state. And at one point, there was the the nascent stages of one because yeah. Syria and Egypt were effectively one country under Nasser's rule. People forget that before the yeah. Assads, Nasser ruled Syria at a, at a, at a certain point from Egypt. So um, the uh, this is really quite interesting. You know, you, you go all the way back to 1952 when he kind of came up as a military dictator and. Uh, all the things that he did and didn't do, and there's some positive stuff here, which is a little tough for some people to admit, but it is really a fascinating history and a, a really superb documentary, and this just blows by in about 80 minutes as well. Also, Some direct people say he set loose the Muslim Brotherhood, that notion of a pan-Arab state, it's but, and that's all, but, but, but he, of course, he was not... But he was a nationalist. He was a he nationalist. Was not, he was a yeah. secularist, yeah. you know? He yeah. was not a sectarian. Yeah, he, was, he was not a sectarian, but the notion of... Yeah. You know, but they, the know, only yeah. analog to him in the region would have been Ataturk in Turkey. Yeah, exactly. They're the only two that kind of had a similar. similar Yet thing. now we have Ataturk, also a secular humanist. Yeah. But now in Turkey we have, uh, you know. Well, it's yeah, you know, given the history of Egypt, it's a really, really interesting doc. Fascinating stuff. Great stuff. And then, un-American struggle, diversity under attack in America, uh, is uh, is from uh, Cinema Libre, who releases primarily left-wing progressive documentaries. Um, most of them, you know, again, there's a bias here. So if you adopt, the, if you understand, if you appreciate the bias, you'll certainly appreciate the film. Um, they are always very, very well made. Uh, but again, politically, from a certain point of view. So if you disagree. You're not going to see your side represented here. Balance is not what these are about. No. But nonetheless, it is uh, it is well put together, and uh, they get all the usual suspects in there. And this is primarily precipitated by the uh, some of the immigration laws and the refugee uh, initiatives of late. And um, it is you know it is definitely one of the uh, one of the more passionately made of the Cinema Libre documentaries. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Uh, the Real Mad Men of Advertising from the Smithsonian Channel. This was such a neat. Uh, uh, you know what's particularly neat about this doc, uh, aside from the fact that it goes back and it looks at all of these uh, individual figures who, in that seminal period of advertising, there was advertising before the 1960s. Yep. Uh, but as television came online and then as television became a thing that people had to, in their homes, and all kinds of people had in their homes, and then as television became a thing that was on for 24 hours a day, right. advertising beca became the thing uh, that almost became like programming on television by the time you and I were youth. Yep. Watching commercials on television was almost as interesting as watching some of the programming on television, and, and a lot of the stuff that was being innovated at that time uh, is covered in this a really neat uh, sort of doc, uh, which of course, you know, um, is sort of in inspirational for that television show, you know. Right, John Hamm and all that kind of stuff. So this is very neat. One of the the neat things about this uh, is how it shows some of the very important women behind the scenes that we don't always talk about. Um, and frankly, you can't look at this uh, doc about uh, the real mad men of advertising and advertising in the 1960s and see how devoid of color it is, uh, because that's just, it was just the nature. You cannot you, you, you when you're looking at it, and thus when someone of color does show up it's striking it's it's jarring you know when you it's look jarring. at jarring like coca-cola ad and there's a brother yeah. with a fro and you're like yeah. oh yeah. oh <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah. Well, all right. yeah teach the did we want to teach the world to sing and then uh we're gonna go out with line 44 by tanja cummings which is a really this is a film movement doc uh, again holocaust and world war ii themed very interesting uh the the this is about a uh, a holocaust survivor who uh, Nathan Grossman, who uh, from the Lodes Ghetto, who returns to see if he can find what happened to his brother. His brother disappeared in '42, presumably dead in the Holocaust. But he winds up actually bumping into the son of the former Nazi mayor of the city, oh. and that creates a fascinating conversation about history and uh, what really happened and who's responsible and all you know uh, who did what. It's really very very interesting through this very these two personal family. Uh, histories and uh, it's quite a good doc line 41 we will see you guys next week